Welcome to Upstream, where we make your worldview bigger and older by taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. I'm Shane Morris. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his listeners, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Well, in these beloved words, Jesus seems to be commanding an emotion. He seems to be telling us to change our psychological state from one of worry to one of peace and faith. But this world sometimes confronts us with a bitter reality that can seem at odds with Christ's words. That for some people, anxiety, depression, obsessions, and even delusions can take hold and refuse to respond to God's word. Mental illness doesn't magically vanish when we say, don't be anxious or be of good cheer, or even when we pray. And we wonder silently, why? Is God powerless? Could the afflicted person be in sin? Into this troubling silence, modern medicine rushes with its materialistic understanding of human beings as mere brains. It's not your fault, doctors tell us. Your neurotransmitters are out of balance. And a few pills later, the results can often seem miraculous. And so Christians face a dilemma. Who do we trust, the savior or the psychiatrist? Which do we treat, the synapses or the soul? Well, my guest today thinks this is a false choice. He thinks the modern church is being called to recover a Christian and biblical understanding of emotion, the mind, and the kind of creatures God created us to be. And he's written a book, a thorough book actually, making that case. Matthew Lapine is the pastor of theological development at Cornerstone Church of Ames, Iowa. He holds a PhD from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and he's the author of The Logic of the Body, Retrieving Theological Psychology. Matthew, welcome to Upstream. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time now. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really love how you framed that from the beginning there. This will be a good conversation. Well, thank you. You, you opened the book by noting that there are these two stories of emotions and psychology that kind of confront Christians. There's a theological story and the psychological story. Could you kind of summarize those two for us and, and where the conflict lies? Yeah, and I should say, you know, these stories that I open the book with are a bit of a caricature for these, you know, versions of it. But I'm trying to paint the picture with some teeth that can help people to kind of feel the tension that um, everyday sufferers do feel when they're sitting across the table from someone. But basically, the Christian story, Christians have, especially recently, tended to be more on the cognitive side of emotion. So there's an old divide, is emotion cognitive or is it, you know, a feeling theory? Like, is it bodily, right? The cognitive side basically says emotions are judgments or emotions are something like beliefs about how the world is. And so on that story, if you're experiencing anxiety, what that reflects is a belief that is sort of underlying the anxiety, which may be uh, right or wrong or true or false. And it's represented by saying things like anxiety is sinful unbelief in God's goodness in Jesus Christ or something like that. And so where a lot of people get to with that story is I'm experiencing anxiety. I must not be believing hard enough or, you know, there must be some sort of spiritual fault in, in me. And so a lot of people who get into that position try and seek help and they may ask for advice. And sometimes the person sitting across them is wondering, hey, is this a spiritual issue or is this a physical issue? And that's where the dichotomy comes to play because you assume that it's a spiritual issue unless you hear enough sort of warning signs or extreme things that maybe actually this is a bodily issue instead. The psychological account, and again, this is too simple, but the psychological account is that emotions are feelings of bodily changes. So something that's uh, William James' classic definition of an emotion. But the idea is that uh, an emotion is something that happens inside my body. And so I don't have active agency over the emotions. They, they sort of arise and they arise from physiological things that are happening. And so this is where you get the classic idea that mental health issues are perhaps chemical imbalances. They're a lack of serotonin or something like that. But the interesting thing is that that, that dichotomy is preserved within the church. And it's kind of a neat way of separating the, the physical from the spiritual and that's a big part of my work is trying to say, no, that distinction is actually a false uh, disjunction. 
I have noticed one of the points that you made in the book and just now actually, which is that there will be churches that lean into what you call the emotional voluntarism very hard where they say, you know, anxiety, for instance, represents a failure at some core level to cognitively embrace the Christian story, right? To believe the gospel or to trust Jesus and so forth. And so that deep belief is actually revealing itself in your emotions. And so you need to go correct the belief. And that's one, that's one kind of church. There is another kind of church that I think is becoming increasingly common, especially with the, the co- confrontations that a lot of religious communities face with mental illness and so forth. And that is the church that says, for the most part, these are spiritual issues, but if it gets bad enough, we'll allow some clinical treatment. We're not sure why or how the clinical treatment meshes with our theology and our, and our account of the soul and what the Bible says. But, you know, we recognize that sometimes that's necessary. And God bless the pastors who say that. I'll just be the first to say God bless them because they're doing good work, but they're not sure why. And I think they're one subsection of the audience that this book could be helpful for because you offer or attempt to offer an account for how these two sides work together. Yeah, I think I think nearly everybody says, look, if it's a medical issue, you should see a doctor. I think th- the disagreement is really about like, okay, so to what extent are emotional disorders medical issues? There is a sort of growing acknowledgement that emotional issues are bound up in our physicality. But it gets tricky because if you say that, it tar- starts to threaten the integrity of the sort of pure spiritual area And yeah, I mean, that's, again, what I'm pushing towards is saying, well, actually, God is concerned about the material world, and the material world is part of what God is doing in his spiritual work. So the psychological story that you summarized or somewhat caricatured there says that emotions are bodily changes, right? They're states of the brain chemically, the neurotransmitters are out of whack, and that's a totally passive state. It's not something that you have chosen to inflict upon yourself or engage in. It's just something that happens. Critique that story for me, if you will, because I think there'll be a lot of people who would be prone to say, well, modern medicine's right. They got it figured out. What, what is deficient about that story if you only take that? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that a lot of people don't realize that the, the chemical imbalance theory of mental illness in general is just not true. By that, I mean, it's way too simple. I mean, you can go right now, you can just pause this podcast and go to the Harvard Medical School and search chemical imbalance and you'll just read, hey, look, it's not an adequate theory of mental illness in general. That theory has been overblown quite a bit. And I think the drug companies have some something to do with it, but also just because it's a, it's a really helpful way of minimizing shame, which is a really important part about helping someone who's really struggling. We have to get to the point where the shame is not adding and heaping burdens on people that they just cannot carry. And so it says, if you say it's not your fault, that's really, really helpful. And part of my point is, <laughs> is not to say it is your fault. Part of my point is to say, it's helpful to know how complicated the overall picture is because most people who have mental health challenges, it, it comes from generational situations where there's uh, genetic components, but there's also just childhood experiences or other traumatic experiences in their, li- in their lives. And so that picture of things, what I call the psychological story, is too passive. And it's even too passive in terms of how the psychological field uh, approaches emotional disorders. So, I mean, you couldn't have therapy with, with it being entirely passive. Like what you think makes a difference and the ways that you act or the experiences that you have, the whole theory behind exposure therapy for anxiety, all of these things are depending on agency for, on the behalf of the, the, uh, the counselee. I recognize that it is a, is a caricature, but I think the reason that I frame it the way that I do is because it's too common a character within Christian churches sometimes. It it just it becomes the sort of way of maintaining that dichotomy. In actual fact, there's a lot of agency involved in maybe not how mental illness comes about. Like you might struggle with depression and anxiety because some of some significant adverse childhood experiences or or things that you've been through. But agency is a huge part about walking faithfully in it and and perhaps even improving the situation. And so part of what I'm doing is just talking about how God re- renews our agency by the Spirit. So in light of that, I have kind of two questions. The first is, you're not against the use of medication 
you sort of incorporate that into an overall understanding of how mental health treatment can work. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I, I think it's worth paying attention to the most recent evidence about how best to use medication. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to get into recommendations here, there, or otherwise. But my point is th- the idea that the medication is a magic bullet, which nobody suffers depression because just like their car gets low on oil, they just needed a top off uh, of, of extra serotonin, right? It's just not as simple as that. You have to ask the underlying contextual framework for what's going on. But medication, I absolutely affirm, is an element of God's common grace to us. And a lot of people will, will be helped for the rest of their lives by being on medication. And a lot of people are helped, especially in terms, in periods of intense crisis from suicidal ideation. And, and just really, really low lows. And so I'm not against medication at all. What, what I'm saying is it's worth taking a step to understand the broader context of where, especially more generalized mental health conditions like anxiety and depression come from. There's more factors involved than just being low on serotonin. That makes a lot of sense. The second part of the question really has to do with this analogy that I've heard a lot in the sort of church circles that are more open to the modern mental health profession. And that is that the the brain is somehow involved in our cognition, in our personalities, in our, you know, and that we get into that and in you get into that in the book, right? We can get into that a little more exactly what the brain's relationship with the self is, but the brain is involved and the brain is an organ. And just like there can be a disorder of the stomach or the kidney or you know, the intestines or, or something like that, there can be a disorder of the brain and that you shouldn't be ashamed of a f- dysfunction there that you have to get treatment for any more than you should be ashamed of a, d- a dysfunction in the liver that you have to get treatment for. In light of what you just said, how would you nuance or, or qualify that analogy? Yeah, well, I, I think that's true. I just think that, to give you an example, I, I have a friend of mine who, um, I'm just going to say up front, I have no idea what to make of this, but he told me that he had a, a lifelong struggle with depression and then he had a heart issue that came up and they ha- they put in a pacemaker and his depression, he says, was gone. And so it's not that there can be, uh, I think it's related to the way that our parasympathetic nervous system is involved in heartbeat regulation, but that that's for someone who's more expert on how physiology works. But it's not that there can't be soul causes when it comes to to mental illness. It's just that soul causes, especially brain chemi- chemistry, is cited without much awareness of how our holistic self is involved in these things. So, I mean, just to maybe give you an example to give this a little bit more teeth, a lot of mental illness sets in for people in college. And there's no good reason to say what, why that should happen with it, with as high a, a likelihood as it does. But if you pay attention to all the things that are happening, <laughs> the, the standard model is the stress diathesis model, which is basically if you have a genetic disposition to a mental illness is a latent possibility inside you until a, a big enough stressor comes along that maybe that gets triggered. Um, so bipolar would be a classic case of that. You hear this a lot with discussion around marijuana and cannabis products these days, that that can actually be one of the triggers that that sparks an underlying mental health condition that was just sitting dormant. Oh, I, I know what I'm going to Google when I'm done with this uh, interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but so anyway, I, the, the point is, just stop and consider all the things that happen when you go to college. Totally different social structure. Br- well, cannabis for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, cannabis, sure. <laughs> Sorry. <There you> go. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, uh, huge, huge uh, um, changes in terms of the challenge. Uh, your Maybe your sleep patterns, you know, substance abuse, as you just mentioned, or substance use, or, I mean, there's just... You're out on your own. You're finally like an independent, actual grown up. I mean, there's tons of stressors that are all layered on top of each other. That's a time when, when a lot of people go through some really difficult things and, and when mental illness becomes a reality for a lot of people. So again, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, look, you can't just say, is this a 
a spiritual issue that I'm not believing God well enough? Is this a physical issue? But you have to actually understand how God created you. He created us in primary relationship to him, but also in secondary relationship to other people and in a, sort of a downward relationship to our work or our, our sense or our purposefulness that we're cultivators of the ground. So that goes back to the creation story. That's, that's fundamental about what it means to be human. And so the biggest frame for a lot of people is just stress, social stress. Like, do I belong? Am I accepted? Am I loved? I, I think that's the, the explanation for, you know, significant increases, at least in the short term, uh, post COVID and mental health challenges. Well, this podcast is all about taking hard questions to the headsprings of Christian wisdom. And this is a very hard question. And the book is really about those headsprings of Christian wisdom. The idea you propose, not to spoil the whole book for people, but the central idea is that there's a, a very old, actually medieval conception of the human person and emotions and psychology that is deeply Christian and that we have sort of given up or forgotten, especially as Protestants and evangelicals. And you're writing from the Reformed tradition, which is my own, and you argue that we need to recover this older understanding of how the human person works or, or at least let it temper our modern discoveries. So talk to us about the basic framework you're proposing, who you consult in that, and then what, what it means for our understanding of ourselves, how the body and the soul interact. Yeah. So uh, I'm going back at least partly because, you know, the theological tradition has been let's say ambivalent. That means we feel strongly both directions. We're, we're ambivalent towards empirical research. And as a theologian, I'm going back to Thomas Aquinas, at least partly because he does integrate medical information. And so part of what I'm claiming in the book is that 20th century theology, especially in the English uh, speaking world, has just not treated the subject of emotions very, very thoroughly. Like we, we act as though psychology isn't a part of theology, but psychology actually always was a part of theology until relatively recently. And so at the center of Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica is his treatment of virtues, vices, passions, and it's a psychological center. It's the hinge. And so the model that I'm trying to re retrieve from Thomas Aquinas is what is in modern times called dual process theory. So I call it tiered psychology. Basically, it means that there's a difference between the sort of layers. There's a top layer of our thought and our choices. So even as I'm saying words here, I'm sort of thinking verbally. <laughs> I'm trying to sort of dig into the understanding that exists at a lower level and come up with the words that I mean, right? But I also could make choices that way. I could say, okay, so where do I want to go to lunch? And I could verbalize Chipotle, which I had today. So that's thought and choice, but there's a lower level underneath that. And that's the one that I think gets overlooked. This lower level actually... A uh, accomplishes most of our thinking. It's our sort of automatic, quick processes. This is largely unconscious, but this is what our remo emotions are responding to primarily. If you think of you know someone walking through the forest and they see a stick that looks like a, uh, a snake, for instance, their unconscious sort of perceptive processes are going to say, danger, snake, danger, right? And so their body will react immediately to that signal of danger and they'll feel an emotion. Part of what I'm trying to point out is that that lower tier actually is much richer than we realize. So one example I like to give is we're aware of how close our relationships are or our status. So when I walk into a room, <laughs> I, I'm aware of whether this is a welcoming room. I'm aware of how people think of me. If I go up to someone and I make a request, I'm aware of my status with respect to them or how strong a relationship is. If it's very polite, I might not be confident in that relationship. I might say, hey, do you think it's possible if you could? Whereas if I know them well, I would say, hey, Shane, can you, you know, all that to say, we never even think about those things. They're just part of our intuitive ways of acting, but are they are being processed at that unconscious level. And so that lower level, the, the problem is that that lower level actually can stress us out. <laughs> so if we start developing these habits of seeing where we just understand that all of our relationships are tenuous, like I'm not sure what anybody thinks about me, then we can start to get stressed, but we're not even sort of aware of why we're stressed. And so it's really important to distinguish between those two upper levels, at least partly because 
it raises the question, what are my true beliefs? You know, I know a lot of people who've had difficult backgrounds with their father and they have a hard time really connecting with God as father because of that experiential background. And I think that that's one of the, one of the things that the church is, is supposed to do is give sort of fill out the content of our theology with the experience of one another. So how do I know what God's love is like? Well, at least partly because I experience love at experiential level within the body of Christ. And so I'm trying to say the body of Christ is a frame that sort of speaks to that lower level. That's what I mean by the tiered psychology. That's very good. And it, and it really opens up the door to the richness of, of what you're talking about, the, the treatment that Aquinas gives and how we can very handily appropriate his categories with the knowledge of, of sort of modern science and medicine in the background, how it does inform things. But I want to throw a, a sort of another caricature at you here, because I think this is the one that is operative in the minds of most people who are not materialists, right? Most Christians have sort of imbibed this, what we would call a Cartesian dualist understanding of the human person. And so this goes like this. I am the, I am my soul. The real Shane is the soul, right? And it's this kind of maybe ghostly ethereal person who lives inside my body, which is just a, you know, a vessel or a house. And the soul is kind of driving the body like you would drive a car, but the body doesn't actually do anything for my personhood or agency. It's just sort of my, you know, it's my physical manifestation, my physical means of touching the world. And when the body dies, well, then I go someplace else because the body was just a shell. It's not really me. How would what you're talking about qualify and change that picture? That's a great question. So Cartesian dualism assumes something like interaction between mind and body. And mind, it just is the soul. So me as a soul, I'm a thinking thing. That's Descartes, I think, therefore I am, right? What I'm trying to say is, no, uh, we are soul and body, as the Bible teaches, I think. I, uh, John Cooper's work is still the standard on that, in my opinion. But soul does not easily, it's not, it's not lined up just with thought. Um, I, I actually think that, I mean, the Old Testament talks about animals having souls, for instance. I think what soul, the soul is responsible for is the immaterial principle is what Thomas Aquinas says it's responsible for is, is all of our life functions. So when I'm thinking, every thought I have runs down a neural pathway. And if I'm on marijuana, for instance, my thinking will not be as clear as, as if I'm not. Or if someone hits me over the head with a hammer, my thinking is not as clear as if I'm not. What I'm saying is I, I'm not supposing that there's an interaction between body and soul. <laughs> I'm supposing that the soul is responsible for all of the body's functions and the body qualifies our agency in that way. So in, in other words, the state of our body and my health you know, either strengthens or diminishes my capacities because I just am body soul. I'm a holistic creature. It's easier on a Cartesian view of things to separate soul and body problems to say, well, this, the soul is the spiritual issues that the body is the physical issues. But, you know, I think as Romans talks about, uh, one thing that I would urge your listeners to do is if you, if you're a reader of the Bible, but you've not sort of encountered or thought about these issues, go back and read Romans 6 through 8 and underlined every, everywhere he says body, flesh, or uh, members. It's a major, major theme of Romans 6 through 8. Romans 8 says that the spirit who brought Jesus back from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life. <laughs> so the spirit is in us and the spirit has the power to renew my, my neural synapses. Like God is actively shaping the created world. But at the same time, a little later in that chapter, it says, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit are also groaning along with creation, awaiting the redemption of our body. And I think it's it's an important tension to hold that the Spirit is in us and in renewing our bodies, but we also are awaiting the day when our bodies will no longer be touched with the curse. You open up the book, of course, with this reference to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and then this sort of hypothetical about a woman named Mary who suffers from severe anxiety. And she's struggling with these two stories and how to reconcile them. Because on the one account, anxiety would mean that she has believed some false things. She's refusing on some level to trust God and his promises. And so that's manifesting in worry. But on the other account, 
she's not at fault for anything. It's just the way her, she's wired and it's the molecules misaligned, you know? So that's a very difficult decision to make between those two. But you, you're saying she doesn't have to make a decision because the body qualifies, but does not replace or supersede human agency. You mentioned scripture. And, and I think that's really important to just go back to the scriptural data on this, because it seems to me that the scriptural data on our agency being real is very clear. We have constant, constant admonitions not to fear, not to worry, to trust God, all that kind of stuff. We, we grow up with that sort of thing. But what would you say the scriptural data is on the other side, where it's saying the body qualifies how much you can effectively obey these commands? What would you sort of point to on that front? Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind, and there's more in the book. I mean, I've got a chapter on the biblical theology of the body where I sort of touched down in three places. But the first thing is that all throughout scripture, our agency is spoken of with organic metaphors. I mean, it, it's right from the beginning of creation. The, the man and the woman are put in the garden and they are to steward the relationship between each other for fruitfulness and then between the land for fruitfulness. You see it in Psalm 1 about how we're someone who walks in the paths of righteousness, obeys Torah, is like a tree planted by streams of, of water, right? It, even the fruit of the Spirit is another sort of mention of that sort of fundamental assumption of organic agency. In that organic metaphor, there is a helpful way of understanding just what or, uh, agency looks like. The agency that we have over our bodies is the agency of a cultivator. A cultivator does not have complete control over the outcome in the garden. There is, you know, a lot of chance things that could happen, water, wind, sun, you know, but there, there is a lot of agency that a cultivator does have. You know, I think when it comes to the cultivation of our souls and bodies, we are merely cultivator, but God brings the fruit. You know, I just think of Psalm 104, where it says that how God will renew his breath over the land. I think that's fundamentally what's happening in the new covenant is that God's renewing his breath, his, his ruach, his spirit in his people. But, and the reason why I, I really f focused in on Matthew 6 was Matthew 6 is a, is a huge kingdom passage. There is, uh, Matthew 6 is, is, uh, delivered within the context of, of the kingdom, which is already not yet. So he's teaching us what kingdom life is, and he's using paradoxical statements like, blessed are those who mourn, right? Happy are those who mourn. Oh, that's, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Happy are those who mourn. That's, but it's, it's a paradox because there is a, there is a sort of in between stage that we're in where, where our bodies are still gr groaning and we're cultivating them, uh, by the spirit. But there is a period of, of sort of frustration and deepening of roots that is happening as we await the fullness of the kingdom. So the, the biggest one for me is just that assumption all throughout scripture that our agency is organic, that it's bound up in the, the health and well-being of our body. There's a difference between medical and spiritual issues in one sense, but they're also deeply entangled in our agency. Mm. One way you see this and you pointed out, actually, I've encountered this issue lately because uh, I've read a little bit about some of the literal wording of passages of scripture that talk about emotional responses. And so there are several places in the gospels, for instance, where the word for Jesus being moved deeply is that is basically that he intestined, right? Like it, it's a, it's a visceral thing that there's a something happening in his gut that is corresponding to this emotion or, or causing it or, or, or whatever. And that's an interesting question because it's like, one of the things you bring up in the book is Galenic. I think I'm saying it right. Medicine. Ga Galenic medicine. Yeah. yeah. Galenic yeah. medicine. Okay. It sounds like it maybe is from Ireland. That's not what it means. It's yeah. <laughs> right. It's not Gaelic medicine. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a medieval idea, right? That. Well, Ga Ga Galen was, was a, a, a director inheritor of Hippocratic medicine, but he was the most, most famous ancient uh, medical doctor for, you know, a long time. So much older than medieval. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and this idea is that your, not just your brain, but your entire body, including some of your, inter your, your internal organs are involved intimately with emotion. And so we, I think when a lot of us read scripture, we constantly hear about the heart, right? And that's, that's one very common one. And we take it as sort of a, a figure of speech because we use that figure of speech all the time. You know, we even put our hands over our hearts when we you know, say the Pledge of Allegiance or something. It's, we're still hearkening back to that. But 
ancients and Thomas Aquinas actually thought there was a little bit more something there. So what do you, how do you approach that? I mean, <laughs> that seems like, that seems medically inc- incredible, right? Yeah, I mean, there probably they're, they're, people have written books about like <laughs> where did people locate the faculties. So, so I'm not gonna give enough rope for people to hang me on this because it's uh, <laughs> it's quite complicated. But including you know differences between Aristotle and others on this. But but yeah, so even late 17th century, for instance, your reform scholastics, you've got people just assuming that the will is the heart. Your heart, like, I mean, your literal, literal heart is what moves your body. So basically there's this idea that your heart is a sort of source of heat. There's a sort of fire going on in your heart that quickens your animal spirits, which are the things that move you. There's psychic spirits, which do your thinking, but you're, you're made up of different qualities. Some of, some are hot, some are cold, some are dry, some are wet. And that's what makes you sick. We still have that language. Actually, we say someone catches a cold, right? Because you know, or this, just this idea that if I go outside, I could catch a cold, like that, that still makes sense to us, but that's just wrong. They they used to think literally, if you went out in the cold, you'd get cold. And so then you'd be sick. I mean, this stuff didn't disappear until 19th century. Really? The idea was in medieval world that the heart moved you. Like the heart was basically the organ of the will. And I think that's, I think that, you know, Calvin even sort of has that even in his own emblem, which is a hand holding a heart. But yeah, I, I think it, in some ways we sort of forget where our terms came from. We don't realize that we're using words metaphorically that maybe previous authors didn't even mean metaphorically. They meant quite literally. Yeah. So, I mean, full disclosure too, I am more than open to what a friend of mine calls deep, weird stuff, like it, 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 things that that strike at the heart of s- sort of scientific certainties and conceits that we have come come to be very familiar with. So if it turns out that the heart really is the the seat of uh, of the will, I would not be super surprised. It, it just wouldn't surprise me that much. Yeah. But Well, it, it certainly seems like physiologically that the brain is more distributed than we realize. Like there's a lot of intelligence in our gut and maybe even around our heart. Yeah. Even modern medicine is, is sort of referring to the gut as the second brain in, in yeah, certain right. ways. Yeah. So setting that aside, setting aside Galenic medicine and exactly how literal that is, I think you make a, a very important point with that, which is that the body, whichever organs we're talking about, does qualify our agency. And so we are physical thinkers, physical feelers, physical psychological, psychosomatic, if you want to go there, agents, which means that when I have an emotion or a psychological response to something, I am not just a soul inside a vehicle thinking that I am actually doing so as a, as a composite of body and soul, of form and matter, which means that by necessity, and now I'm going out on a limb here, by necessity, treatments for problems like anxiety or depression, will have to involve both sides of the equation. They cannot just focus on one to the neglect of the other. Yeah. And Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score has, he makes an interesting point and it remains to be seen how accurate this is. But basically part of his point is he's saying that traumas, which are experienced on a sort of lower register bodily level, that thinking doesn't go all the way down <laughs> and that for things that are sort of exist on that second tier, a sort of interaction between the body and the second tier, like I said, need to be treated with, with bottom up treatments. So he talks about all sorts of, you know, physical manipulations that people can go through for that. I think we have a lot to learn about these things, but I, I certainly, one of my big points that I'm trying to make with the book is a sort of lead into a, a fresh appreciation for the diversity of the means of grace that, that God has given us. This is always sort of, for psychologists, this is already sort of second nature. Like I have another friend who was attacked by a dog as a child. And anytime a dog would bark, he would start to panic. Uh, basically, I, he, he's just said, I couldn't think myself out of it. And so what he did was his brother had puppies and he went over and he held the puppies and it experientially taught his body, Hey, you know what? You can, you don't have to be triggered by this, but, but even the word triggered. So (laughs) I, I would encourage your listeners, go look up John Green, 
and sympathetic ner uh, nervous system and just watch a short video about how the sympathetic nervous system works. It's really astounding. And watching that can help you know what's happening. You know, like your sympathetic nervous system is distributed and, and, you know, there's a reason why you have stomach issues and you've had them for months because you're really stressed out and your body is literally rerouting blood away from your stomach to your legs and to your chest and all that. Cortisol is breaking down <laughs> all of these proteins to produce extra glucose so that you, you, it's like you're eating candy all the time so that you can get through this, this period of your life, but it's going to break you down. You know, like there's a lot of things to learn about the body and the way that we can address the body more directly. So I, I a hundred percent agree with that. Experientially, this is just very true too. And, and you could write a whole book about how much of our lives, how much of our thinking, how much of our, even our willing and our emotions are really controlled or strongly influenced by automatic processes or things that have, that are going on in the background. And so it's like, we, we have this conceit that we're just sitting here in the driver's seat of our, of ourselves making decisions from moment to moment and that everything is just a, our decision. When really we've got this wonderful, massive staff of God appointed delegates who go out there and in our bodies and our, and our minds who are doing all the stuff for us that we don't want to do ourselves. I mean, you don't have to think about every single time your heart beats. You don't have to think about your digestion. You eat your food and it's done. And you don't have to think about certain, certain processes that seem like processes of the will, like learned behavior. So my wife and I met, well, we, we met at church, but then one of our first dates was dancing. We went swing dancing. That was our thing. Cause that was what all homeschoolers did at you know, the 2010s. <laughs> yeah. And so we went, you know, we went swing dancing and by that time I had already learned. And so all of this was automatic and that was very helpful in sort of winning her admiration because I didn't have to think about those moves. It was just second nature. And that's what we mean right, when we say second nature, but it's, it seems to me very logical, what you're saying that other things can get stuck in those automatic processes as well. And they're not always good things. We have some control over them, but it's a qualified control, right? It's like, um, was it Jonathan Haidt, you quote, who says that emotions are like riding an elephant? A man riding an elephant, yeah. <laughs> a man riding an elephant. Yeah, that's, that's very good. I like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. I mean, I, I, I talk a lot about plasticity and I'm using the word plasticity in a slightly different way sense that neuroscientists will use the word neuroplasticity. They, they talk about the idea of being able to form new patterns. But for me, plasticity is the ability to take a new position and hold a new position. It's the quality that's required for habit formation. Like if we can uh, take new positions, like if, if our body can take a new form, like for instance, if I, you know, take up running and I go five miles a day, you know, my cardiovascular health is going to take a, a new shape right? That will enable me to do that. That it can be a great good and it can be a great evil. <laughs> and, and I think that that's essentially what's happening in Romans six, when Paul be, begins to talk about like, how, how will the reign of Christ become realized in our mortal bodies? What he says is he says, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God and present your bodies as instruments of righteousness, which leads to your sanctification. So you got this choice. You, you present yourself to lawlessness. It's going to lead to greater and greater lawlessness. You present yourselves to righteousness. It will lead to your sanctification. And then chapter eight uh, adds this crucial link that it's the spirit who's bringing life to your mortal bodies. It's not just the habit. Anybody can kick the porn habit, but not anybody can put on the righteousness of Christ because that requires the spirit. And so there's all sorts of books out there about habit. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, that Christianity is just about habit. Yes, you can pick up habits. You can drop habits. That's, that's, that's true. You can read Charles Duhigg and all atomic habits and all these guys, but that's not sanctification, but sanctification does involve internalizing in your body patterns of righteousness but these are patterns of righteousness that have reference to God, that, that, that are oriented towards God and his worship. And those patterns, in some ways, are going to be really, really cross-cultural. They, they, they confront culture. I mean, I was reading uh, 2 Corinthians 4, where Paul says, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life may also be manifested in our bodies. Like, yeah, that's the Christian life. 
we, we, <laughs> we're caring about in our bodies the death of Jesus because his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so I think, I, I think that even that word is just hopeful for people who struggle with, with mental health challenges because it's, it doesn't have to be a liability for, for spiritual maturity. It may be a way in which God's power is manifested in that weakness. I wonder if you could take an example, let's say the example of depression or anxiety, and you, you sort of do this in the book toward the close, and sketch for us an alternative account of how it might work. So not in, it not, this is not necessarily applicable to every case, but on, on the basis of a tiered psychology, how could something like an anxiety disorder get established? And then how would we approach it in light of a tiered psychology? So typically, if someone, you know, let's say struggles with anxiety, they're, they're going to have a genetic range that sort of puts them in, in the pattern of possibility. <laughs> there are probably people born who anxiety just probably won't ever be an issue. Maybe anger is the issue for them, you know, because we all handle stress in different ways. Depression is sort of re resigned when it comes to stress. Anxiety is sort of passive aggressive about stress. Like I want control, but I'm not going to do anything. And anger is like, I'm going to take control. I, I, th that I've had enough of this, you know? So general Patton was probably the third category there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, look, you know, smacking someone in the face is, is not better than, than being anxious. They're just different patterns, but there's a range, there's a genetic range that's sort of established, but then there's also especially early childhood experiences. I mean, Gabor Mate has written about this, about being separated from, I think, yeah, I think this was him who was separated as a child from his mom who was put in a ghetto and, and just the, the ways that that shaped his experience for life. Like just for, for one thing sort of gave him a predisposition to, towards he has ADHD, he has compulsive behaviors. It's, it's this sort of, you know, uh, hypervigilance to what's, what's happening around you, a lack of security. Um, childhood experiences go a long way to, to putting someone in a pattern of, of perhaps having mental health challenges later. You'll go through things in life and then maybe you'll have enough difficult experiences where now all of a sudden you, you have this spiral that starts to come about. So you're feeling anxious and that feeling is triggered from stressors that you have. But then you start thinking things like, oh, I wonder if, oh, what if that happens? What if that happens? And then maybe you, maybe you also feel like there's something that you can do to sort of, you know, help the situation. Like maybe you, you warn people or you, you know, have compulsive behaviors. But what happens is that your thoughts, like, I wonder if that happens, then that sort of triggers back to your unconscious filter, <laughs> which says, okay, I better look out for that now. And then you begin to see that warning signs for that, even if they're not there. And then that triggers a deeper sort of bodily response, more anxiety. And it becomes this spiral. So your thoughts, your, your unconscious judgments, your bodily states sort of spiral deeper and deeper until you're really trapped in that sort of, in that sort of anxiety. So part of me trying to treat Matthew 6 was not to say, look, anxiety is neutral, that we shouldn't care about it, but rather to put anxiety over against faith, really, that seeking the kingdom is the proper response to it. So I'm not saying that anxiety is, prim you know, is caused primarily by a, a lack of faith, but I am saying that faith is an antidote and faith is the alternate path, which is to say that I'm seeking God in the midst of it. And part of that is just opening our hands up to what God is doing in our life in a way that is calming and restful. And, and so, I mean, look, Matthew 6, I don't actually prefer calling that a command. I think when he says, don't be anxious, he's being comforting the same way that I'm being comforting to my daughter when I come to her bed at night. He uses lilies as an example and birds as an example. And so he's saying, don't be afraid, my child. Your father has you seek the kingdom, right? And there is a sort of, a sort of opening your hands and a sort of giving up of, of control that is necessary for overcoming anxiety. It's very hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, like we, we, I, in our family, we still walk through this path, um, regularly. Like, how do I, how can I relax? How can I really let go in God and, and say, you are enough? I think that's very challenging. But I also think there are means of grace to doing that. 
I mean, <laughs> I was talking with my wife just earlier today and she's like, why don't you just go take a walk, find somewhere dark, just lay down, just listen to God in prayer. And it's like, all, yes, all of those things are fantastic. Working out is fantastic. Being in fellowship with other members of Christ's body, these, these things are fantastic for orienting us and for strengthening our, our trust and our uh, capacity to look and see what God is doing in the world opening ourselves up to the Spirit's work, renewing work in our lives, uh, meditating on Scripture can be d- deeply healing. I mean, th- these are means of grace that the Spirit uses in our lives. Uh, singing. I play the guitar. I love to sing uh, in my devotional life. So these are all patterns of life that the Spirit uses to renew us and to calm us and to, to, to enable us to rest in God, who is our life. That's fantastic. The uh, the book closes with these six theses about therapy and embodiment. The first one is that the saving grace of God is the beginning, middle, and end of Christian therapy. What do you mean by that? God's uh, his creating gift, but also his redeeming gift. Then is the beginning of how he's healing us. I mean, the, the Romans eight says that the um, God subjected the world to the curse in hope, right? I always, I've always thought that that phrase was odd. Like, what is the hope of, of the curse? And, and I think the hope of the curse is that it, being in exile is unsettling. It's anxiety inducing. It gives us a hunger. It gives us a thirst after righteousness and rest in, in who God is. So his, rede- his, his redeeming work is the, the promise of return. It's the opening of that return. The, the middle is this period that we're all in where we're already not yet. We're already safe in the arms of Jesus, but we're also, you know, aliens and strangers in a world that is sometimes hostile and sometimes scary and, and all those things. But in the end, we will see him face to face and there will be no more tears and, and uh, all things will be made new and he, we will live with him and he will be our God for blessing and fruitfulness just as it was meant to be in, in Eden. And so I think therapy is always couched in that narrative and we have to be aware of that narrative from beginning to end that, that it's God's initiation that brings us into fellowship with him. The third of those theses is also very interesting. You said that our physicality puts limits on our change, even as God renews us. And so there's a, there is actually a bound to the not yet that holds us back before the resurrection. How do we know when we've hit that? How do we know when we've actually run up against a barrier of our physical fallenness and we cannot get past it until Jesus raises us from our graves? Yeah. First, I admit that that idea of limits is deeply mysterious, you know, because because God can do whatever he wants. I mean, he could grow an oak tree out of my cement slab in front of my house, but, you know, it hasn't happened yet, you know. But uh, oftentimes people find that they've hit their limit when they have their first panic attack, right? You know, if you haven't experienced it, it's, uh, I mean, it's it's not fun at all, right? It, but, you know, a panic attack is basically the, the body reacting in a severe way <laughs> that sort of really alerts you, you know? And so, um, I mean, I think that there are all sorts of signs when someone has sort of come to the point of burnout or to, and oftentimes all those, those things are brought on by, you know, sometimes extreme suffering, but often by just people pushing past their limits in ways that are unhealthy, you know, especially when we're young, we want to prove ourselves. We want to feel like we're achieving and, and we're worth it. We want to prove our worth to the world and to everyone else. And, and, uh, we'll hit our limits that way. I think the harder and more challenging question is the long-term one that you're saying is like, will this get substantially better? You know? And I, and I think that that's a much harder question to discern. It takes, it takes a lot of time. I would say that, uh, for some people it is therapeutic to just say, look, this is the cross that I have to bear. God is with me in it. I would say, uh, you know, there are certain issues, even in our, my own life, the life of my family, um, where we are saying, no, God, uh, we, we trust that you're here with us in this and that you're offering both hope and help in the moment and, and that we're making progress and we're seeing growth in this. Um, and so that's, that's our continual prayer. I don't know that I have a good answer for, for how you know, but I, I think my, my broader point is just to say, 
there is an already not yet tension when it comes to the the governance of our bodies, that there are some things where God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Like, like he said to Paul with his thorn in the flesh, right? And those, those things we can receive without panic or without trying to control them and, and rest in God in, in the midst of them, accept those limits as, as part of how we display the life of Jesus in our bodies. If there, I mean, there's so many questions and we're coming up to the end of our time here, but one that raises itself to the top of my mind is if you are the family member or someone that you love is afflicted with a mental health condition and you want to apply not only these truths, but the sacred words of scripture to their situation. I know that for many people, it seems like scripture just hits a brick wall of the the condition and doesn't do anything. How would you say we should apply scripture as loved ones? without coming across as, you know, thinking this is going to fix your situation? If you just believe this, or do you just read this harder? Well, I, I would say very simply, don't use scripture as a sort of magic talisman or, or like a magic incantation, but use scripture as a means of, of sort of weaving your agency slowly. I mean, you need to be like scripture is the script of the story you're living. You're not living a story that's primarily about you. You're living a story where you are a called member of, of Christ's church, right? But that story from beginning to end um, is a story of God's faithfulness. And so um, that story needs to get in you. Like it needs to become the story that you're living. And so you do that by, as Jen Wilkins says, by, by making deposits every single day, not just running to it in the moment of intense, intense anxiety and expecting the magic verse to, to, to blow it away. So scripture is formative, but it's formative because it gives us our master story. It tells us who we are. It tells us what we're living. It tells us who's the hero of our story. I was raised in a, in a um, conservative Christian environment where we spent a ton of time in scripture. I was saturated with the stories of scripture from a very young age. And I was even saying that to someone today. I just value that so much because for me, the pieces came together easily because I, I, I knew the stories and I knew the verses in the King James. <laughs> Probably knew the Iwana theme song too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the scripture needs to get in us as a habit and a pattern of life. But I think, you know, there's, there's lots of means of grace that, that, you know, scripture comes out, even as we're just sitting here talking, there's passages of scripture that come to mind for me because I've, you know, made a habit of memorizing and made it a habit of reading. And so it needs to become a part of us primarily. It, we just can't, um, expect it to to work in ways that it doesn't, which is as a as a sort of um, as a sort of magic verse to to take away all, all of your fear. Even as I say that, I'm thinking, you know, Christ used scripture to ward off temptation, right? So um, th there's lots of uses for scripture. When if you've got someone who has religious scrupulosity, which is um, type of OCD, scripture can be torture. For a loved one that I know, um, that was taking a break from reading scripture was really helpful. Not that she was taking a break from the Bible entirely because it was part of her, you know, but that it was, it was an occasion for that anxiety to really rage when she read scripture. So. Yeah. I mean, that could take you to an incredibly dark place as a, as a sufferer or as someone suffering with a, a person you love when scripture itself becomes a point of torture and, you know, obsession and torment. That's, that's a that's a terrible place to be and this is this is where this conversation is so important i don't think that anybody this side of the resurrection could offer a full list of definitive answers but i found that your work offered some extremely helpful questions and then some extremely helpful categories to make sense of this in a less dismaying and contradictory and just nonsensical way than many christians have and i know this is hard too people encounter things they don't understand they deal with the with situations they just dismissed before as you know you're just not spiritually mature enough or or you're not taking care of your body or something like that those answers aren't as forthcoming as you think but i think there's a lot of helpful stuff here this has been a marvelous conversation but i know there's a lot more two questions first of all where can my listeners go to find out more about your work and to kind of read what you've got coming next and then do you have any recommendations 
outside of your work that they should check out afterwards? Yeah, I have a website, matthewalapine.com. And I'm not sure how updated it is, but I, I think I've got, on the, I think there's a recommended link where you can see some of the things I've written. There's a shorter version, just a sort of a summary of the contribution that I wrote for Christianity Today Pastors that's worth reading, perhaps. Yeah, so there's some links on there. Uh, in terms of other recommendations, I have really been helped by the, the work of Eric Johnson. His Foundations of Soul Care is an excellent book, uh, but that's more sort of like, how do you do counseling and, and what type of counseling is best and all that? It's, it, can t- it, it can get a little into the weeds in terms of the background of all that. But if someone likes to read systematic theology, God and Soul Care, I highly recommend because it's a very, it's a systematic theology that's very practical. But on a much more on the ground level, um, some of the books by David Murray, I found really helpful. He's a theologian who's really plugged into these things. But the best one, I think, is J.P. Moreland's Finding Quiet. You know, Moreland has a, has a story of, um, some mental health challenges also, and he's a Christian philosopher. And that book is basically his own sort of private memoir and, and sort of sharing what helped him. Uh, that's the one that I give to people first who are, who are dealing with, um, depression or anxiety because it, it covers some of the same ground. Honestly, I met him and w- we talked a little bit, but I didn't realize, um, he had already written Finding Quiet before, um, before I finished the dissertation and then I read it after the dissertation and thought, oh, wow, <laughs> we did a lot of the same things. So um, that's a great book. I had Dr. Moreland on the podcast actually a few months back, and this was about his book on miracles, but he was uh, one of the writers who sort of pushed me or, or pulled me back from the direction of the, the highly physicalized account of mental illness and psychology and so forth and, and said, well, hang on, Shane, you know, we're Christians. We believe that uh, there is, there's a lot more going on and you're not fully accounting for that. So I, I was very appreciative of that. Yeah. Finding quiet is excellent. Yeah. Well, my guest today has been Matthew Lapine, author of The Logic of the Body, Retrieving Theological Psychology. Upstream is a program of the Colson Center. When it comes to the hardest questions we ask, we have thousands of years of accumulated wisdom from which to draw from a faith that is the explanation of all reality. So come upstream and learn to understand the world, the church, and the God who has placed you in them. Connect with us on social media or find more resources at upstream.colsoncenter.org. Matthew, thanks for joining me today. It's been great. Thank you.